your main take out of the weekend there? Uh, a few areas. I mean, we got well beaten in our midfield. Between the arcs, we were really poor at both winning the ball, which is obviously the most important thing, but then really average in transition, and we, we just didn't use the ball well. So they were the, sort of the two takeouts of the game and of areas, particularly the transition side that we pride ourselves on, where we've just been able to win the ball in those scramble situations through the midfield between the arcs we were very poor at. The start of a new season is an exciting time, the first reveal of a long summer of work. One game, one week at a time. Well, it could have been worse than it was, but it wasn't anywhere near it good enough. Franklin wasn't ready, the midfielders were smashed, and nothing worked out the way they wanted it to. You are listening to the Swans Blogs Swans Cast, the number one Sydney Swans fans podcast. In this week's episode, we review the Swans' disappointing first round loss to the Bulldogs. We talk about Franklin's lack of fitness, the midfielder's performance, and give you our Monday champions and villains. I'm Justin Mitchell, and with me is Swans cast regular Stephen Park. So, Stephen, you were there at the game. I was there at the game. Both at different points at the ground. I was behind interchange. Where were you sitting? I was sitting up on the top level, of course, where I like to sit and watch the game unfold, Justin. And I have to say... It was very disappointing. Yeah, it really was. We kind of started off with a bit of a bang. Heaney took that screamer. It's surely going to be up there as a finalist and mark of the year. And then he took another really good contested mark in the forward pocket. At this point, we'd just got in the ground. I was in the uh, beer line. The ATM or FPOS had stopped working, so we were kind of watching it over about 30 different shoulders. But uh, I noticed he kicked it on the full, and after then, I wish I stayed in that line. So you're telling me... The reason the Swans went downhill is because you arrived at the game. That's when it all went downhill. No, it went, it went downhill when the FPOS stopped working. Oh, the <laughs> FPOS, right. Fair enough. Well, we almost had it there. My, I was actually with an Adelaide supporter and a St Kilda supporter at the game, and I was there sitting there. Heaney kicked the first goal. They had the run of the play. My mate who's a St Kilda supporter said to me, the Swans are going to run all over Western Bulldogs today. And from that moment, it turned and it went into a disaster. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened, um, if they just kind of fell asleep or not, but they really looked smoking hot in that first five, ten minutes. So I was watching it going, woohoo, yeah, this looks like we could be onto something this year. And then, yeah, no. <laughs> That's the next... And then we ended up 40 points down yeah. halfway through the third quarter. Now, I had to go digging around through AFL tables to actually find this. Um, but our first half score was the lowest first half score we've had since round 14, 2008. And I literally gave up trying to find an equivalent low score for a first round match. That's just how bad it was. Yes, it wasn't very good at all, was it? I cannot believe. Do you know we actually had seven, not one, not two, not three, but seven out of bounds on the full when kicking for goal? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I can believe that. I can believe that. Heaney put the first one on the full, which was only five minutes into the match too. Yes, I know. I cannot believe that we could actually have that. But it's a surprising statistic. Do you know that there was more out of bounds on the full kick this weekend than there has been measured in the past 10 years? <laughs> well, it's not too surprising, I guess. On AFL 360, they had the two coaches on and... I think it was Hardwick who made the comment that the scores are at the lowest level, certainly lower than they were last year, but the scoring shots were higher than they were at the same time last year. Isn't that amazing? What does that say about our kicking, about the AFL kicking? No better than it was a couple of years ago. It's probably even worse. That's exactly right. Imagine back in the 80s and 90s when you had people like Ablett, Dunstall, Brereton, lock it all running around if they missed such easy shots as what are being missed in today's football. I cannot believe that I was sitting at the St Kilda Gold Coast Suns game yesterday. There was a player 15 metres out, probably a 25 degree angle. He's gone 
the right foot banana and he's put it out of f- bounds on the full on the other side of the point post. Oh, I'm not surprised. A lot of players are doing that these days. It's a, supposed to be a bit of a chop out, a bit of an easy way to have a shot at goal. But if you go back to like the 80s and 90s when your Dunstalls and Lockets were running around, they weren't kicking snaps over the shoulders. Even Gary Ablett wasn't. He was kicking it from the pocket, acute angle, drop punt. That's and their exactly right. goal kicking accuracy was like 75, 80%. So mm. I think they were doing something right. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's changed. Even the midfield were able to pinpoint the accuracy compared to what we're seeing in the AFL these days. And yes, yeah. the pressure's picked up. The speed of the game's picked up. But elite players are still elite players. And if you are not picking people who can kick, then what are you picking? To be honest, I can't really answer that. But you'd hope that you'd be picking players who can kick. Unfortunately, it has been a bit of a trend on our side for a few years now to not be able to kick. Yeah. But um, look, top of the agenda, the Swans, they lost the opening round match to the Bulldogs on Saturday night. It wasn't a particularly good performance. The uh, 1-5, lower score at halftime since 2008. We made a really good comeback in the last quarter, but did we deserve to win it? No. Could we have won it? Yes. If Franklin had kicked that goal, that he had the sec- the set shot, the second last goal that we had, instead of being called play on, and he got that, I think that might have been enough for the Swans to go on with the win. I agree. The problem with this game that I have is because we got so close, I actually think it's wallpapered over some very big cracks that we have in our arsenal. I believe there's some concerns around our midfield about how slow they are and about how accurate they are. I believe there's some very, very big concerns about our back line and about the way they play together. If you actually watch the game, I don't know how many times I saw Dean Rampey, who I don't believe played that well himself, was going off constantly at the back line telling them what they were doing wrong. But it wasn't in a way as a coaching role. He was actually being quite volatile towards some of them. Yeah, he has a track record of being quite uh, aggressive in his communication and defense. And if you do get up and close and personal with him, especially at the SCG or any of the other grounds, he's very, very vocal. He's probably the loudest player on the ground. Uh, Certainly a lot different to someone like a Kennedy who always seems to be a bit quieter, lets his football speak. He's um, very much in your face. Mm. And maybe that's something that we, the Swans needed. Yeah. A bit of that chalk and cheese between Kennedy and Rampy. Yeah, and I think Parker's a pretty good fit in that as well. But uh, look, unfortunately, our three leaders didn't have a particularly good game. I wouldn't put either in their best. No, me either, sadly. No. Now, look, it's time for our Monday Champions and Monday Villains. So, Stephen, kick us off with your Monday champion, please. I'm actually surprised to say this, but I'm actually going to say the Monday champion for me is the AFL. Ooh, why have you put the AFL as your champion? I actually watched three games on the weekend. I watched Gold Coast Saints, I watched the Sydney Western Bulldogs, and I watched the Port Adelaide Melbourne game. And I actually think this new 666 rule and the being able to play on from a behind has actually revolutionised the game. And the only coach that I actually saw do anything to try and flood back was Alan Richardson. He deliberately started playing his two wingers right on the edge of the line. And as soon as the ball was bounced, they'd run back into defense. So that is still a possibility to play men behind the ball. The AFL have done a terrific thing in actually setting up these new rules. And I believe they've done the best thing for the game. Yeah, i got to agree. The the new rules actually do make it a bit more exciting for the quick kicks that come out. I guess one of the criticisms over the last couple of years has certainly been the extra one or two in defence. When teams have had that really quick clearance and they've bombed it inside their forward 50, a defender's just marked it. I think so too. And I think it actually just opens it up. But one concern for me in a Swans perspective is if you do not win the centre clearances, You're in serious strife. Look, how many hit-outs to advantage or how many hit-outs did we win by, yet we lost the centre clearances? That's a major concern. So we had 29 more hit-outs around the ground. Callum Sinclair had 13 hit-outs to advantage, while Tim English had 19 hit-outs altogether. We still lost the centre clearances. 41-32. Yep. Isn't that a concern? Well, and the centre clearances, 11-10. Yep, it's a concern. And in... 
in the first half, we actually got smashed in it. So they did well to get back into it, but it really was a, a pretty poor performance by the midfield. And what I actually saw when I entered the Port Adelaide Melbourne game, they actually had a debutante playing in the midfield and they had Travis Boak playing on the wing. They actually worked at perfection because they had Melbourne had Angus Brayshaw, Jack Viney, and I can't remember who the third one was rucking to Max Gorn. But all the midfield for Port Adelaide did was man up and play contested ball against their opponents, and Travis Boak would just run off the wing come straight in, and he'd read the play perfectly off either Ruckman every yeah, single yeah. time, which is why he ended up with 44 possessions. And I think teams are going to do that. They're going to work that out anyway. And they're just the rules are there. I think the first couple of rounds, it'll take teams to adjust to it. Then after that, it'll be almost like nothing ever changed, really. I agree. I have a Monday champion, and I watched a fair bit of the Fremantle North Melbourne game, and I liked what I saw. I really enjoyed watching Fremantle play. It was very un Ross Lyon like. But given his situation 12 months ago, even two weeks ago, and only getting his chance because Jesse Hogan flipped out, it's got to be Cam McCarthy for my hero, for my Monday champion. He good kicked, choice. He kicked five goals, was really good, looked like a genuinely good footballer, um, and I was really happy to see him do well. So, yeah, I was really happy with that. Yeah, because he had a. 12 months off, was it? Yeah, 12 months off. He, he left GWS. He wanted to go to Fremantle. GWS refused to trade him, so he went over to Western Australia and just played local league because mm. they refused to release him. And then he uh, was picked up by Fremantle, had a, a troubled year or two, and then he's he was on the outside before this match, and yeah, he came good, came good in a big way. Yeah, and could turn Fremantle into not so much a contender, but a team that is actually worth following again. Yeah, they, they were really exciting to watch. I, I agree. Like, they, they could really become a good team to watch and really competitive, just like Brisbane were last year. If they can match Brisbane's effort last year, even if they don't get the results, I think they're going to be entertaining. Agreed. I actually have a soft spot for Fremantle, and I have a soft spot for Ross Lyon. Sad, isn't it? <laughs> just a little bit. So, my Monday villain has got to be the MRO for the Ben Cunnington decision. So, I don't know if you caught it, but during the uh, Fremantle uh, North Melbourne match, there was um, an incident off the play at least 45 to 50 metres off the play. I think it was um, Wilson or someone was running across, and he was running behind Cunnington, and Cunnington sort of seen him in a peripheral vision, turned around and whacked him in the guts, and sent the sent the player flying to the deck. He got, I think it was only a $3,000 fine. Yeah, I thought they were going to, off the ball hit, they were going to actually suspend. Yeah. So they've actually gone against their own rule. They have, yeah, they have. That's the same as the, was Jones on the Carlton Richmond game, wasn't it? Yes, They went yeah, against their rule there as well. So yeah. why come out and say this and then not do it? That's what I don't understand. I, I don't know, like, um, they were talking about it on, on AFL 360 and they were, very critical of the decision on AFL 360 and said, you know, what what kind of mandate is this? What kind of uh, idea does this give to other players? You know, you, you, at the start of the season, you lay down the law, you, you set the landscape, you say, this is what we're going to do, we're going to punish you for this. But they haven't done it. So now they've got precedent and players are going to go to the tribunal now and they're going to have precedent. That's right. All right, moving on to my Monday villain. And yes. I'm actually going to stick with the Swans here. And I'm actually going to say the Swans coaching staff. I don't know if this is going to be popular or not. This might be divisive, but please explain. Okay. Now, I could start with the fact that they actually played Lance Franklin, who was underdone and put him on managed minutes. First round of the season, allotted time, managed minutes, you're playing the gun forward of the competition like this. Not a good move. Secondly, you play Grundy, Melican, Rampy on the back line with Aaliyah Aaliyah, four tools for their small forward line. Not such a great move. Thirdly, you then realise your mistake and you play probably your premier defender, in my opinion, your premier defender in Grundy, in the ruck and around the ground and up forward. He rarely plays forward. Yes, he was drafted to the club as a forward, but he rarely plays forward. Yeah. He had no idea about the structure of where to play in the forward line. 
Yeah. He looked lost out there, and that wasn't his fault. It was the coaching fault. Yeah, now, I've agree. got one more. The fact that they actually played the way they did for 15 minutes showed that they actually changed in that last quarter. Why hadn't they done that when it wasn't working for them previously? I think that was purely effort-based. If you go, if you go and, and watch that first half, of, well, the first 20 minutes of that quarter and the first 10 minutes of the match and, like, patches of the third quarter, it was purely effort-based. You can see and they just smashed into the contest. They were like, okay, we've got to go and do something about this. And that came from when they were 40 points down. So the fact that that effort wasn't there from the start, you know, it's poor. It's very disappointing. And that has to be there from the start. And too often, too many times, it just hasn't been there. So I'm not quite sure what's got to change. I know the players have said the senior players will bounce back. And that's been a recurring theme that the senior players will bounce back. But I, I think it's quite poor when your younger players are usually outperforming your senior players. I think that's really representative of, I wouldn't say a poor culture, but uh, maybe a malaise, a bit of complacency in the team. That's what I think it's reflective of. I agree, Justin. And the question I have for you, and think about it before you answer, do you think that the Sydney Swans went into this game thinking they were going to win it and yes. that's why they played Buddy? And that's why they went with the structure that they did. Yeah, I thought, and we talked about this on Thursday as well, where you thought that the uh, tall forward line would stretch the dogs. Now, going by what the team was on paper at that time, I honestly thought that team, as it was picked, would have done better than their final team that was actually put on field. Because Callum Sinclair is a forward, okay, Sam Reed is forward. Okay, then you could actually push Franklin out. Then you have a Lear in the ruck. So you've got that athleticism around the ground. Um, and you had Callum Mills in defense. I would have put Zach Jones in defense and had Callum Mills and Zach Jones in defense. We just went in too big in at the back for what you said before. I agree. That's the way to put it. It's disappointing. And I don't think we will go very well with our back line if we continue to play four big talls. Yeah, it, it was a bit too lopsided, wasn't it, On at the front and the back? It was um, kind of like, it reminded me of one of those old way scales where you're putting a brick on each side and you're trying to balance it up in the middle. That's right. And the concern for me is that would have worked 10 years ago when you had your big one-on-one, -on -one, big bulky defenders, your big bulky forward line that could beat them physically one-on-one. -on -one. It would have done okay if our midfield were on top, but they weren't. The times that Melikan was running out and his opponent was five, six, seven metres in front of him. We'll talk about the Melikan subject in a minute because we do have a lot of observations to discuss. But I do want to raise some of the stats between the first half and the second half. So at half time, we've said before, 1-5-11 was our lowest first half score since round 14, 2008. And that was against Collingwood uh, a couple of years after they knocked us out of the finals. We were... Five marks inside 50 behind, nine contested possessions behind, 21 disposals all up behind. We were 14 hit outs up, but minus four clearances and minus 16 inside 50s. At full time, we turned some of those around. We were five disposals behind, but we were minus 26 in contested possessions. So I think that's indicative of how much the dogs wanted it and how much we lacked that effort for still large parts of that second half. And how little we wanted it. That's they, Exactly. They still had five more inside 50s, despite the fact that we outscored them, I think, by 19 or 20 points in that second half. They still had more inside 50s. Uh, we had an extra 15 hit out, so we finished plus 29 in that category. And I, I think we finished about plus seven or plus eight in the hit outs to advantage. Uh, we had nine less clearances and we actually ended up with one more mark inside 50. I think it was 16 to 15. Scary, isn't it? It's really scary. Looking at the, the stats, it is really scary on how poor we actually played as a team. Not individuals, as a team. I wonder if it's a case of the Western Bulldogs have our number because the same thing happened last year. We talked about it on Thursday, but if you go back to the stats last year, they smashed us in... Uh, contested disposals, clearances, and inside 50s, almost identical numbers, and we still won, still won that game by seven points. Question I have for you then, is it because when our midfield gets beat, our team plays poorly? I th yeah, I would say that's 
fairly common throughout the competition. If your midfield's getting beaten, it's going to be very hard for the defense to stand up. But I think our defense in particular has lost a fair bit of experience over the last couple of years. And it didn't have Nick Smith to rally the uh, players down there either. So you had Grundy, who was kind of playing around all around the ground. You had Aaliyah for the first two and a half quarters, who was... Honestly, I have no idea what position he was playing for the first two and a half quarters. Uh, you were left basically with Malikan, who was having an absolute nightmare at that point. Shaki and uh, Norton were just killing him. He, they could have been standing still and he still would have lost a contest. You have Mills, who was in defense, pulled out of defense, put back in defense and pulled out again. Uh, I think he, even Heaney had a rotation down there and Jones had a rotation down there at one point. It just wasn't, it just wasn't a good matchup for any of them. No, it wasn't, and my concern was Nathan Jones. Sorry, Zach Jones um, got lots of the ball, but actually turned it over consistently. Yeah. That's a concern, and yes, metres gained is a terrific thing to have, but metres gained is no good if you're giving the ball up to the opposition every single time. Yeah, and I know people have criticised Jake Lloyd, and they said, oh, they didn't think he had a very good game. He was, I would say, comfortably our best player. Um, and the coaches thought so too. He got three AFLCA votes, so I think that's representative of the kind of game that he had. He had 630 meters gained, nine rebound 50s, and two inside 50s. So that just goes to show how much work he did, and it was a massive amount, 35 disposals and 10 marks. So uh, I thought he played pretty well. But he's always a quiet achiever. You just don't actually see him do anything flashy he just gets the ball he moves it forward yeah in point so it's an interesting one i thought mcveigh was reasonable as well yeah he was pretty solid look he didn't have many afl fantasy points uh, he only finished with 57 afl fantasy points but i thought he was pretty solid yeah i agree tom papley what do you think of his game first half easily our i would say easily our best player in the first half um, that first quarter in particular, when everyone else just couldn't get their hands on the ball, he was attacking it fiercely, and he was really exciting to watch, and he looked like a genuinely good midfielder at that point. I think he faded as the game went on. Uh, maybe he doesn't have the tank yet for it, but I was pretty impressed with his game. I was too, and pardon the pun, but he was like a bulldog going for the game. <laughs> yeah, he was, very much so. Yeah. He, he was throwing himself in very Ben McGlynn-like. Yes, yeah, exactly like Ben McGlynn. Good player, good game. What about Sinclair, mate? Uh, I was pretty happy with his game. Uh, he did win the hit out, so that was expected. I would have hoped he got more disposals, but he did okay. He was effective. He had 13 hit outs to advantage, which is good. Actually, that's pretty bloody good, to be honest. That's um, right up there with Max Gorn and um, Brady Grundy, but his midfield players couldn't do anything with the ball. Yeah, the one concern I probably had with Sinclair was I don't think he was as good around the ground as what he usually is. Yeah. And I think they tried to link up with him too much, and then it didn't come off. Yeah, I think also because the ball was always in a scramble contest, there wasn't really a lot of clean disposal, so there wasn't really much opportunity to use him as an out. Uh, there was that play, I think, in the third or fourth... No, the fourth quarter when it went down our wing, and, we got it, and Blakey got it into to Lance Franklin, and and that was like a couple of link-up of those players who had sort of been in and out of the match at that point. Yeah, that's right. Okay, what about that mark and that player, Isaac Heaney? (laughs) What do you think? Uh, Surely he's up there for another $10,000 prize with the JLT Mark of the Year award. That is for sure a contender. Now, was that better than last year's mark? No. No, last year's mark was was something special. It was good, good, but it wasn't that good. I actually have to say, I think, personally, that was about the only decent thing he did for the match. Yeah, he had some patches in the last quarter when they shifted him into the midfield. Um, I certainly wouldn't put him amongst the best. He was pretty quiet for a good two and a half quarters. Uh, as Longmire said after the uh, after the game and today as well, you know they had to shift him into the midfield because he was quiet and forward. We just weren't getting the ball in for him to do anything with. That's right. I think a major concern for us is I don't think our fitness is there. I really yeah. don't. I, our speed looked atrocious, which over the past three or four years it has because we're an in and under team that bomb it long, but we had didn't have any run. We had none. Yeah, and the dashing players that we usually have, they weren't really dashing much, unfortunately. And 
it kind of it makes you think a little bit of Dan Hanabry and as you well know and the news and everyone who follows the AFL would know at this point that Dan Hanabry is a mile off football I mean Saints won't see him before the bye that that is like guaranteed mm. the Swans probably would have played him anyway despite the fact he can't run and they played him despite the fact they couldn't run but my question is are we missing that kind of player because I don't think that Ryan Clark is a replacement for, for Hanabry in that role. And I think the Swans brought him in to try and be a little bit of a replacement. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. I actually think they've gone away from that type of player. And I actually think they're looking at a different model with Ryan Clark to do that because of the different rule changes and things. But let's face it. I actually think the Swans are in a situation, and don't get me wrong, I think every club does it, but I think the Swans have fallen into this rut where they continue to play injured players yeah. until they fall apart. And I think that's what the Swans have done to Dan Hanabry. Yeah, and look, that wouldn't be the first player they've done it to either. No, and like a player, if he's, any wor- if he's worth his salt at all, whether they're injured or not, will want to get out on the field. Lance Franklin's a perfect example. Yeah, Lance Franklin should have been benched. I- I'd like to get your thoughts on that one. Should Lance Franklin have been benched? Yes, I wouldn't have played him. Um, I actually thought it was a big risk when they s- started talking about it, that he was ready to go, and I'm going, hang on a sec, he hasn't been training. He's started four days before the game was coming on. Yes, he did it last year. He's 32 years old. He's worth a lot of money. Crowd want him out there. Yeah. Do you take a risk like that? My answer is no, personally. The club thing said they knew what they were doing. Yes, fair enough. But then to have a player that's there for managed minutes, yeah. first round, playing against a really fit and running side, and yes, Horse didn't know what they were like, but he's seen them through the JLT, yeah. and we look slow in the JLT, and then we put in players that are not match fit. Yeah. I'm not so sure it was a great idea. Yeah, look, Western Bulldogs make great in the JLT, but, I mean, the JLT, you, you shouldn't take much of what happens there. You take it all with a grain of salt, really. <laughs> to be honest, teams are playing different things. They're, they're trying out different tactics, different setups, different players. They're just trying things. They're trying to see what can work. But, um, yeah, I, I agree. And, look, my question for our listeners for this week's uh, Swans cast is... You are the senior coach. Would you have played an injured and unfit Buddy Franklin on Saturday night? Now, we got a lot of replies for this one. Some of them we can't read, unfortunately, but we'll read some of the best ones. So, Jonathan from Twitter said, Injured, no, unfit, yes. He needs to get match fitness and match play is the only way. Jess from Twitter, You don't go to the Vatican without wanting to see the Pope. Give the people what they want. Plus, an unfit buddy is still better player than most after full fitness. You know, she's got a point there. And this is, this is what you said before. People want to see him play. That's right. And that's what's scary is that are they doing it for the crowd and not for what's best for the team? Yeah. So, Andrew from Twitter says, depends. Can he hurt himself more or just lacking fitness? Kick straight. He sneaks us a win. And I'm sure not a replacement does more anyway. Short answer. Yes, I play him. Gail from Facebook, who said he was injured and unfit, had good preparation and said himself he was ready to go. Mids were the problem. And this touches on what you said before. Players are going to say they're fit even when they're not fit. Kim from Facebook, if Buddy was injured, it made no difference because we couldn't get the ball down to him anyway. I agree with that one. Just going back to Gail's point, and she said, who said he was injured and unfit? He had good preparation and said himself he was ready to go. That's correct. But I look at Tom Lynch from Richmond. He was unfit but had said he was ready to go. He blew up after the first 10 minutes. Yes, he kicked two goals early, but after that, he came out in his press conference after the game and said he wasn't ready for the speed of the game when he came in. Yeah, exactly. And that same thing happened in Melbourne. Melbourne really suffered from that Jack Viney in particular. Uh, They were saying on AFL 360, they estimated he trained for one week. Yeah. That was it. And they fell to pieces, Melbourne. Uh, They were odds on, heavy odds on favourites to win that, and they just fell to pieces. Perfect example of with that as well, Justin, was Jack Stevens for the St Kilda Football Club. He actually, I was near the bench in the St Kilda Gold Coast game. He actually ran over to the bench because he was basically stuffed. He couldn't run anymore. And they said, no, we can't 
afford to do a rotation with you. You need to just stand out there and wait another five minutes. So oh, he no. went down into the forward pocket and stood there with his hands on knees because he was buggered. This is because he hadn't been training. Yeah. Now, you think about that, a midfielder who would have been fairly fit before it all happened and would have been still running because he hadn't an in, had an injury. That was a different type of injury, obviously. Yeah. Whereas Buddy, who'd just come back from an operation, who hadn't really been doing any training whatsoever. Yeah, he really only trained for three weeks. That's when right. You, when you consider it. And I think that showed in the first quarter. He, his mobility just wasn't there. He just he didn't have that burst. He didn't have the capacity to go on those long, you know, lung-busting sort of runs. All he could do was sprint about 10 metres, and that was about it. That's right. He didn't have the penetration in his kicking either. No. And you could tell that was when he got the ball. Yeah, when he got the set shots, he just wasn't going to kick it. And he kicked one, two. That sec, that first set shot was a bit of a shank too. I think he kicked one on the full as well. So He did. Yeah, so look, Ali from Facebook, she says Buddy is not the whole team. There are 21 other players out there that need to do their share of the work. When he's out there, he's still influencing play and how our young guys work. We are not Buddy, we are the Swans. Very true, Ali. Rowan from Facebook says it's a bit hard when he gets no delivery for three quarters. He looked all right in the last turn to me. Yep, yeah, uh, he did look okay with five disposals, but like we said, he kind of blew up a bit. And Amy from Facebook said, honestly... It's too easy to say no now after we saw how he performed. Most of the time, you back him in and he performs great. He wasn't the only one who had an off night. That is very, very true. Lewis Malikin was playing his first game for nearly a year, and I think it really showed just how he was able to play and just his impact on the game. I think it might have been better to have Colin O'Rourke or Jackson Thurlow in for instead of Malikin. I'll go again, and I say you cannot play four big backmen who are reasonably slow in the same team. But you look at it this way. Eight of our of the first 10 goals kicked against the Swans was Melikan's direct opponent at the time. I'm not saying it was his own fault because the midfield were allowing the ball to be delivered with ease into the Bulldogs' forward line. But Melikan was often caught short yeah. on his direct opponent. He, it got to a point where he was either five metres in front or five metres behind. He literally didn't know where to stand. As soon as they shifted Alir onto Shaki, Shaki's just disappeared from the game. That's right. And I would actually say that even Alir didn't have the best game that I've ever seen him play No. in defence. No, and I think that kind of goes back to the fact that he was played in about six different positions throughout the game. And if you're played everywhere, you're never really going to settle and you're never really going to have an impact anywhere. No, that's right. And that was the same as Heath Grundy. I can't understand why would you be playing him all over the ground when he's probably your most wily defender that you've got. Tell me that. Yeah, exactly. Look, another one that had a um, pretty poor first half and who's been a pretty important player for us is George Hewitt. Now, we talked about how important it would be for him to play on uh, Jack McRae. And Jack McRae easily, easily won the lollies on that one. He had the he had the chocolates, the sugar, the donuts, the cake. He had the, the whole pantry in that contest. George, he uh, was absent for the first half. He had six disposals and a couple of turnovers. Yeah, it was not a beautiful sight. The not, last no. quarter, he was okay. Yeah, he had a lot of the ball. Other than that, I, how many did he have up until three-quarter time? I reckon it was probably... Nine or ten possessions. Yeah, he had uh, six in the third quarter, and he had 12 up until then. So yeah. he still had, I think, another 11 or 12 in the last quarter and a couple of turnovers, but overall. Yeah. He had that tackle as well, the one that led to Bontempelli's goal, which could yeah. be either way. What did you think of Callum Mills's return? Chopping and changing too much. I think they should have just put him in one position and left him there. Honestly, when he went into defense, our defense looked a bit better. But mm -hmm. we also took a bit a bit about midfield. And then when we put him into midfield, the midfield instantly looked better. But then the defense just looked like they were going to concede goals at will. I just hope it's not a repeat of 2017. That's my only hope. I agree. I hope so too. Thank you so much for being on again. Thank you, Justin. We will be having our next Swans Cast episode, the Swans Cast Extra, on Thursday night, where we will preview the Swans and Adelaide Crows game at the SCG on Friday. Until then, go Swans. Go Swans. Go Swans.